What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Pure Pleasure with Dewey Halpas on Equal Vision Records and Sound Talent Media. I am Dewey, your host with the most, bringing you more great content week after week. This one is an awesome one, guys. Thank you for checking this episode out. Keith Buckley from Every Time I Die is the guest on the program today, as you've seen from the episode description on your podcast catcher. I don't even know why I announce it anymore. You guys have it already. You see it on Instagram. You see it wherever you saw it and uh, decide to click on this. I don't think it just springs up on your phone, but if it does, I'll keep announcing it. So Keith Buckley, every time I die is the guest on the program today. Big thanks to him for coming on board. We've been trying to get this one done a long, long, long time and it's gone back and forth and our schedules are crazy and it's just it's always interesting trying to book someone on the east coast when you're on the west coast because there's like convenient times and there's times that aren't so convenient for both of us and they never really matched up and we finally made it happen um it was it was awesome and i had a great time keith and i have a lot of things in common that i wanted to talk to him about from personal life perspective not even music related but things in our personal life that we've been through in, in similar ways. And, and he was super gracious to talk about that. And uh, yeah, I usually don't talk about personal stuff on, on the podcast as much as I can avoid it because it's not about me, but I really wanted to talk to him about these things. So towards the end, we get into that and uh, I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. But first I want to give a huge shout out to Andrew Hurley from fallout boy for hooking us together. He is uh, here in Portland as well. And I had him on the show a few years back and he's been super gracious with uh, passing some things around for me. And we ran into each other at the Coheed and Cambria Mastodon Every Time I Die show where he was cruising around with Keith, introduced me to Keith and then uh, connected us together. So thank you, Andrew, for that. Sorry it took so long to get it done, but we are here and I'm glad it happened now versus before because there was so much more to talk about, so much more had happened and it's just a uh, an interesting, interesting time we're in. So Thank you for coming back week after week. I really appreciate it. You guys uh, really make this show go round, and I, I love putting in the hard work because I know you guys are going to listen and get something out of it. So thank you so much for coming back over and over and over again. And thank you for telling a friend. Thank you for telling a family member. Thank you for, you know, reposting, sharing, anything you guys do social media wise, but word of mouth is the best. And uh, yeah, we're trying some new things and seeing what sticks. So I appreciate you guys hanging in there. All right, let's get some business out of the way and then we'll jump in. So purepleasurepodcast.com is the website. You can go there for, you know, every episode, show notes, merchandise, anything you need from the, the show you can find on the website. Uh, purepleasurepod at gmail.com is the email. If you have guest ideas, want to shoot me a message or, or a comment or a question, shoot it my way. I respond to all of them and uh, yeah, we've been getting a lot more as of, as the show has been growing, but I try to get to all of them in a, in a timely manner. So thank you so much for being patient. If it's been a few days before I respond, um, I'm probably super busy with other things and not checking email as often. So anyways, thank you so much for, for bearing with that. All right. So we're going to jump into this one. I don't have a whole lot more to say and I want to get to this conversation. So without further ado, Let's get into my conversation with Keith Buckley from Every Time I Die. Okay, I'm ready. Excellent. Dude, you, you damn vocalists in your water, I tell you what. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's a little ridiculous sometimes. Yeah. Constantly hydrating. <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh, uh, thank you so much for coming on, man. I appreciate it a lot. It's. I know it's been a long journey getting yeah, we've us been here. trying to get this going for a while and it is <laughs> entirely my fault so uh, i apologize but i'm glad we're, we're getting a chance to now dude yeah awesome and and uh shout out to uh to uh andy for getting us hooked up together yeah. and, and uh what a weird way to meet is through <laughs> through yeah. uh him because i i man like we never met playing music i i met you maybe once or twice when I was working security at a club called Loveland here in Portland and you guys played okay. with uh, High on Fire. That was the first yeah, time I saw yeah. you and you guys were sharing a bus or something. Yes. And I think they had Joe Preston playing bass and dude, yeah, that solidified with me uh, being a fan of, of Every Time I Die because it was like, dude, holy shit, like this is, cool. like I had the record and stuff, but like uh, never seen it live and then it made right. complete sense. 
Um, yeah, that was a good tour for us. I mean, that like you know we were pretty young still at that point, but there was um, a lot of people that had never heard of us or given us a chance before. You know, coming to see High on Fire, um, you know, rightfully so. But uh, yeah, we had a lot of uh, repeat offenders after that show. People coming back saying that they saw us, you know, there, and we hooked them. So that's always a good thing. Hell yeah, dude. And you guys were such nice dudes, like, and, and not saying you aren't now, but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you guys were so nice to the staff yeah. and everything. Like everyone was yeah. so polite and like, that doesn't happen very often, surprisingly. And, and, uh, yeah. you Real remember shame, those things. Mm -hmm. I think it was mm -hmm. between you guys and minus the bear were the nicest dudes to the staff mm. and like, you know, ordering meals and stuff and not getting bummed out if something's gone. Like, uh, yeah. Anyways, it's it's yeah. uh, it showed back then and it shows now and I I just I'm stoked for where you guys cool. are at and you have Goose playing drums for you. Yes, we do. Which is my yes, boy and uh, from back in the Fear Before the March of Flames days. So there's there's That's so great. many different avenues of connections here. But totally, uh, dude. So uh, we're stuck in the we're stuck in the fucking wildfire zone here in Portland. Like I Jeez, my voice guys. might be a little weird. I may cough a little bit, but like. Air quality here is, is garbage right now. And we've been, you know, everyone's been inside with COVID. Everyone's been inside with the fires now when things were just starting to kind of loosen up a little bit. And mm -hmm. uh, how how are things in your neck of the woods? How are you guys holding up? Um, I, I honestly, like myself and my family, um, doing, doing pretty well, uh, all things considered. It's kind of one of those things where... Um, you, you know, it, it, I had been touring for so long that I was, you know, always in the back of my head, like, man, I could really use just like, I don't know, like a year off of touring. You know, I, my, my daughter's, you know, four now. Uh, so these are some pretty impressionable years. And, you know, I just wanted, I hated the fact that I was coming and going and coming and going. And, you know, she didn't, a lot of things about her that I was missing. And um, so obviously as a, as a fairly new father, I was always kind of like, yeah, I could use some time off to just sort of relax and spend time with my family and uh that's exactly what i got so <laughs> uh, you know it, it's still nice for us because uh, i've been touring for pretty much straight for i don't know 16 17 years um so you know and my wife and kid haven't had me around so it's it's good for us to all sort of get back and, and take advantage of this the, the times we missed um but of course it, there are some setbacks it's a little strange you know being a, a full-time uh presence in the house and just you know sometimes a little curious about what you know what i'm supposed to be doing and when so yeah getting getting matriculated back into the, the normal life is is uh not without its trials sure dude and and i mean coming back and getting screwing up your family's routine <laughs> mm -hmm. that's yeah. the best and you feel like a, oh, yeah. a sore thumb <laughs> like i feel that just coming <laughs> home from work every day like I fuck yeah up every yep. day yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I have a really hard problem doing nothing, though, which uh, I always thought was sort of a, a positive character uh, trait to have is that I'm just kind of like always doing something and trying to be productive. Um, but I don't need to be that way here. So it's, um, you know, it's kind of like I got to learn how to relax because I get a little aggressive with, with my productivity and my cleaning. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, I can only imagine. Like you've been a busy dude, and like you said, touring for yeah. so long. Like I, that's one thing I always saw was you guys were always on tour. Like, yep. uh, exhausting yeah. drummers and mm -hmm. <laughs> destroying mm -hmm. the world. Drummers, bass players. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> me, uh, me and Jordan and Andy are the only three original members. But Steve, our bass player now, was actually like uh, I think our second bass player, and he was like he was with the band when we really started like taking it full time and touring a lot. So he's he has experience with it and. Yeah, you know, he's he's always been a good fit. Yeah, dude. Uh, so are you in? You were in Buffalo. You still live in Buffalo? Yep. Yes, I do. Wow. Do, do so like you, Andy and Jordan. Do you guys all live in Buffalo? No, Jordan um, moved to Arizona. Um, oh wow. And yeah, he's got a, his wife and kid are there with him. And um, Andy is Andy lives not too far away from me, uh, a little bit further out of like downtown. But he's he's wrestling now, so he's. Ne he's still never home you know the, this break from touring he he didn't stop he's just like oh i guess i'll just fucking find another way to destroy my body and <laughs> keep yeah. me on the road <laughs> wrestling yeah but it's fucking awesome i watched i just watched him last night too i mean he wrestled every wednesday night at aew but it's such a i don't know if you want to get into it now about andy but it's just Dude. such, such 
we can get into anything. That's the yeah. that's the joy of this is we can get into anything. But uh, yeah, he's wrestling now. That's that's insane. I've him and I have messaged back and forth on Instagram since the beginning mm-hmm. of the, the podcast. Like anytime I had like when I had Buzz on or somebody like that, yeah. like, he would hit me up. I was like, dude, you need to come on the show. And he'd be like, yeah, yeah, email me. And I emailed him, and he never emailed me back. Like a year goes by, and I'll hit yep. him up again, and he won't he won't respond. But then he'll randomly like comment on a on a show, and I'm like, dude, mm-hmm. let's do this thing. So I this won't yeah. come out for a little while, so I'm probably going to do this in the meantime, but I'm going to make a wrestling promo video calling his ass out, and I'm going to post it on Good. Instagram Good. That's and see the if only that way. works. That's, you got to speak his language, yeah. I mean, oh, he, he doesn't, he, uh, you know, emails don't uh, don't really get onto his radar, but if you challenge him to uh, <laughs> a wrestling yes. match. and I'm his size, maybe a little bigger, I don't Perfect. know, but he's, uh, yeah, he's going to get one. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah, he definitely get his attention. Dude. Anyways, so going back to you, I I don't know a ton about where you come from and kind of what your what your upbringing was like. Like you have, uh, you know, you've always been on my radar as Keith from Every Time I Die, and now recently we can get into this too later, but uh, an author which I just started yeah. watch uh, oh, nice. two days. I ordered it and it came in the mail and, and uh, I started well, thank it you very much. two days ago. And dude. I'll just say this right now. Like you are a wordsmith. I knew you were with, yeah. with lyrics, but, but in a, in a book form, like, yeah, it is it's different, <laughs> dude. It's amazing. Like the, the, Thank you. I'm, I feel like I'm expanding my vocabulary every Good. chapter I read and it's, it's challenging me to have to like look up certain things. If I don't, you know, like I don't ever, I don't get that very often. It's Good. super rad. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's nice. I mean, that that whole thing of just like using, you know, what you're reading as a as an uh, uh, an opportunity to to learn new things. I mean, I, I definitely had that uh, growing up when I was listening to like Raging Against the Machine and Bad Religion. Those are the two bands that, and this was before the internet. So like, those are the two bands that I would be reading the lyric sheet and be like, I gotta go. I, I need to find an encyclopedia. Like, I don't know who this is. I don't know what he's talking about. So. Uh, those are always that was always just part of the reading experience in, in my life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if, I, if I'm doing that now for other people to get out of it, that's great. I, that's mission Dude, accomplished. There, so the, the one in your imagery, too, like this is another thing like there. And I know it's early in the book, but uh, there's this there's this. What did you say? It's it, um Oh shit! Now I'm blanking on it. Um, where where, where the mother is uh, the mother is disappearing like um, like a piece of glass into the ocean. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, dude. Yeah, the the imagery <laughs> like I'm literally like like I can't. I have trouble reading books because I lose uh, what I read. Like I'll read a page and then I forget it because yeah. I'm constantly focused. But this forces me to focus and like get these vivid image cool. images in my head anyways yeah uh enough. no that's good because that's i mean that's just a different learning style like I, i'm the same way i i can memorize things as long as i sort of put them in a visual format in my head um you know even like it's just things just like number sequence like if i if i want to remember a number sequence it, it's very visual and, um, mentally um so i know that that is um a really good way to get people to remember it is to cre- just try to create an image that is very easy to understand you know universal so um yeah i i, I find you know just kind of looking back at the at the way that the, that book came about and the way that scale came about i was very adamant about trying to just create as much imagery as possible and you know that i, I try to do that with the lyrics too so sure but yeah the, the lyrics are much more like short form like yeah uh yeah. not single serving but like the it doesn't it creates a moment and then it moves on to the next and right uh the other thing is the fucking things the dad says to the guy, like where he's like, now you're the bastard. I always knew you were or something. Like, yeah. like, dude, I was like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> this is awful. Like, like the, 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 you feel the pain for this guy. Like Jesus yeah. Christ. Like, did you have a, a pretty good upbringing or were you, is this yeah. like autobiographical at all? Like these, these no. struggles? No, not, not, not for the most part. I mean, my, my dad was definitely not a, an, an abusive alcoholic. Sure. Um, 
Uh, but I, I, it was just kind of, I had to figure out a way. And, and the thing is, I, I don't really want to make it autobiographical because I, I don't want to be like a one trick pony. Like, well, if I, if I didn't live it, then I can't imagine it. So, mm-hmm. um, a big, big theme in, in watch was that, um, the, the character, John, um, he, he, he needed uh, a female energy to sort of counterbalance him, but every female in his life disappeared, um, you know, in one yeah. way or another. So he had to sort of. He, um, sort of learn to balance himself, which he never, you know, d- depending on how you interpret it, he, he did or he didn't do by the end of the book. But it was just important that I, I found a way to get all the male characters out, of, like eventually. They all had to leave eventually. So uh, the, the, getting rid of the father figure is very, um, you know, at a, at a pull and uh, just sort of part of that whole mythology of, you know, killing off the father to get to the mother sort of thing. But, yeah. Dude, it's crazy. And it's so like when you when these stories come to you, do they come to you complete? Like your character development, like how do you go? How do you navigate that? Like, do, do you see these characters as a person already, and then you just break them down, or are you developing it as you go, as you're as you're like mapping out these books? Yeah, a lot of it is just sort of. Um you know, it's kind of the thing where like a detective will look at a map of an area where the crimes are committed and not realize the theme until a bunch, you know, a few of the, the points have been filled in. So um, it's really it's really like that. Like, I'll just start with a few like very basic character traits for each each character and then um, try to find the story that connects all of those traits and, and figure out what kind of life someone would had to have led in order to make this you know uh, this moment uh sort of line up with a, a previous moment or a moment that's going to come later it's very important that the, the the flow of their lives makes sense you know like even if it's a terrible life and it ends short you know quickly and painfully or whatever like uh, i need to make sure that all of these things that I definitely want to hit on would fall into that storyline. And, you know, they might inspire this person who was once uh, very empathetic to become very callous. And, you know, they have to have that experience that gets them there. So you got to find a way to just like sort of morph the the people into what you eventually want them to become. So, yeah, it's just I mean, it's a lot of a lot of stuff that I don't really plan on doing until I sit down and and it comes out. Honestly, Um, I know it's a very vague way of, of saying it but I, there's just some times where it's just like it, all right i mean the inspiration hits and i have an idea and that's the idea that i need it just happens to come at the right time so sure dude and it's it's just, i mean you just literally plan out a life like it's crazy yeah. like it's something that yeah. now being a father like you can kind of look at things you want for your kids oh, yeah. but you can't really plan it out for them but it's kind of similar where you're kind of you see like the the little budding personality and and uh like what i have three kids of my own so like the the you see their personalities coming out and you see the decisions they make when they start making a little bit of decisions on their own. And then it's kind of, I guess in a way similar, but you just can't, you can try to influence it as you will, but it's going to just work out the way it's going to work out, which is frustrating. (laughs) Yeah. That's uh, that's definitely a thing I found out having a child is that like, you know, before they arrive, you sort of sit down and look at yourself and, and, you know, sort of assess them. You're, uh, your, your, your inferior qualities and you think, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that these things that I don't like about myself don't come out in front of my child because I don't want them to be influenced by it because I know that I I'm still working on this in myself. So I definitely don't want it, you know, to sort of make it contagious for, for my kid. Um, that not only does that never work because it's going to come out no matter what, exactly. but even if, even if you manage to suppress it entirely, it's I, I, the miracle of, of uh, the miracle of genetics that they'll still show it a little bit, you know, even the thing that you're like, there, there's no way they've never heard me use that word. I'd never use that word in front of the kids. I, I you know, I, I, I'm just as an example of like swearing, like, you know, they're going to, they're going to pick it up and they're going to see how much fun swearing is. If you have fun with swearing. So oh, you, you yes. really don't have any control over it. Dude, one of the things, and this ties it back to to watch one more time when he's going off on those those like those uh, strings of uh, uh, profanity, where yes. he's just like fucking cut <laughs> shit. God, uh, my son. So my son has like it's not autism, but it's a uh, it's a chromosome chromosomal abnormality that which which just fucks up everything from brain spine oh, everything midline right heart anything oh, yeah. touched by the midline. Um, uh-huh. But he has become this 
what's the what's the that Christmas story movie where uh he wove a tapestry of obscenity that's still known to be oh, hanging yeah. over Lake Michigan? Uh, yeah, yeah, he does yeah, that. Christmas. He takes yeah. all the words he's heard and he just he calls me these names and he uh, string yeah. them together. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Yeah. And yeah. that reminded me of that because it's just like Grace and my son just like telling me I'm a fucking bullshit yeah. goddamn <laughs> stupid father or whatever. Uh, and then no. he'll follow it up with I love you, you know. Right. But, yeah. but he's yeah. just he loves the reaction. The mm -hmm. worst is the checkout line at the at the grocery store. Oh, yeah. if, he, if he lays into somebody being a uh yeah. Anyway, oh, but boy. that ties <laughs> ties me to that. But the, the swearing thing, yes, absolutely with the kids and that yeah. and your bullshit always just gets into them. It always oh. will. Of course. It's just where they choose to uh, internalize it or push it away. Yep. Oh, yep. my God. Dude. Yeah. Well, tell me. So, and, and this goes along, too, with in my, in this is just my train of thought. But um, Every Time I Die has always been like a band that, uh, in from the outside looking in, my, being myself, um, there's always like this, this focus on like the, like, like sleazy, dirty side of a lot of things, right? Like the 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 Reno of the world, right? Like the the yeah. uh, Reno versus <laughs> Vegas, right? Like right, you right. guys would be Reno on like a Vegas stage. Like there's always like this like uh, kind of gutter, kind of like uh, the seedy part of things. And I've I've been to Buffalo many times on tour, and I I know like a, a decent amount about Buffalo. But I grew up in Alaska on a small island, and then in Wasilla. Oh, so nice. I know about growing up somewhere where people are, you know, pretty much not like you and mm -hmm. never will be. And there's not a ton of things to do. And, and Buffalo is different, of course, but watching yeah, like sure. watching like uh, uh, the map change video, mm -hmm. it's like watching Gummo, but in Buffalo, oh, right? Yeah. Like, yes. Where does Very that fascination so. with that side of things come from for you? Because there's it, there's just so much exposure to so much, <laughs> um, you know, I, I feel like there's so many things that are on display that even the most taboo things are sort of, um, uh, I don't know, they're, they're not, they're overt now. And I mean, you know, people know how to monetize the uh, fetization of, uh, of certain, um, you know, otherwise horrible things. Um, but I still think that there's, there's a stigma around like, um, a lack of success, you know? Um, and I, and I, I feel like Buffalo is just such a, a hardworking blue collar town. That's really never bothered too much with successes. I mean, we have, we lost four Super Bowls in a row, we, you know, have, <laughs> have uh, mass exodus of jobs and Bethlehem steel, uh, you know, laid off all its workers. And I mean, it's just, Buffalo has been sort of like a very slow tail spin for a long time and hasn't really bothered itself with trying to pick itself up and, 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 be performative in a way that like, Hey, look at us. We're a city. We're on the map. I mean, it's just been very self content, um, with being, you know, who it is and what it is and accepting it. Um, and I think that that looks to a lot of people, uh, uh you know, the, the Las Vegas people as uh, very ugly. Um, but I think that the, there's the people in Reno <laughs> that, <to use> your, <laughs> that understand that there it's, yeah, it's not successful. It's not flashy, but it's, still beautiful in a very human way um which is full of errors and you know imperfections so i think that we're just kind of proud of that um you know if that makes sense i i'm mean, not proud of it and like we're we're brazenly stupid or lazy or anything like that it's just like no we know who we are and we're, we accept ourselves and you know we'll work to better ourselves but it's not for uh tourism it's it's not for any sort of clickbait um so i think that i just kind of wanted we all wanted to show that there was that side of buffalo too that was very you know the one thing that you, you see in a lot of those clips in that video is that everyone a lot of people are very happy <laughs> doing yeah. what they're doing you know yeah and that's that's sort of the, the point is that like, OK, they're not doing anything that anybody would tune in to watch or, you know, send money to or, or click a million times uh, a week. But these people are all really fucking happy doing what they're doing. So that was just kind of the underlying point that we wanted to make. Dude, it, it came across and it always has come across like it's it's something that, you know, I've always, there's always times in my life where I could be walking down a certain street or in a certain situation. I could tell like my soundtrack would be every time I die, like, you know, like that just big guitar, like just uh -huh. gnarly, uh, you know, and, and 
it's something that's that's uh, it's been cool with you guys because you guys have always seemingly after you know seeing you the first couple times in the scene as it was like you guys were always like the cool band to have their shirt right like even, I bet you a lot of people couldn't even name a couple songs right that oh, were wearing sure. the shirt yeah. or yeah. or the eye logo right like the the and it was such like a it was like I compare it to the Deftones right like I had Chino Chino on the show uh, a few weeks ago and I was telling him like everything you've done. Your whole life has been the cool thing. Like oh, people for emulate. Sure. They're, they're a perfect example of it. They're yeah. a perfect example of it. And yeah. he's like, dude, I was just following the style in Thrasher magazine. I was like, well, I guess <laughs> I didn't get Thrasher magazine until after because every time, like when I got the first Deftones record, my dad bought it for me at the mall. I had uh -huh. him, I made him buy me a windbreaker because right. she was wearing one, right? Like the same thing with every time I die. Like you have that factor that you don't it's not something I think is intentional either. It just, some no, bands have all. it and some don't. And you guys I, had it and it's so awesome because. I, I totally agree. And I, I, I view it as like an outsider. Like, I don't know what it is. I don't know how it happened, um, but I think it's really fucking cool. And the fact that it's happening to us is uh, just something that you can really only be grateful for. I mean, it's not something you can be like, oh yeah, we, we, we plan to like that. So our vision is, uh, is, is perfectly translating. It, it's nothing <laughs> like that. It's just, we're really just doing what we like to do, uh, whatever is making us happy. And it seems to be catching on. So, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm thankful for it. Yeah, dude. And it is something you don't see very often with bands that don't deserve it in a way that when I say that, I mean that aren't doing something real and true, right? Like something uh -huh. from the heart. I think that's yeah. where people gravitate towards because there's not a lot of it left. Yeah, it's weird because, I mean, you could definitely say that, and I absolutely would say that, is that people just smell bullshit, and uh, they, they don't even have to point out where the where the pile of bullshit is laying, but they know they could smell it, it's in the air, and they tend to avoid that. Um, yeah. But on the other side of, of the coin, uh, there's also just such an obsession with perfection, um, you know, that, that we almost want to watch the things that are – um, n not very natural. And we definitely want to watch the things that are not honest because I don't know, we like train wrecks, I guess. I mean, I would explain the Trump presidency. Why are we, why do we keep <laughs> yeah. watching or listening to this guy? We know, we know it's, we know it's bullshit. We smell the bullshit. We almost, we can almost literally see the bullshit, but we still are drawn to it for, um, not the same reasons that we're drawn to, you know, uh, the truth or, or honesty, um, but it is nonetheless a very uh, attractive thing. So I, I'm glad that we're attracting people for the reasons we are instead of people all coming out to see us, you know, see what kind of bullshit we're going to spew next. Dude, yeah. And you you guys have earned it. I mean, you've been on the road more than most bands, you know, for longer than most bands and are you know putting out records consistently and 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 pushing the envelope i mean it's it's something that's just always been there and it's something i've always appreciated seeing you know from you guys and and uh yeah it's just good stuff you know and and that that whole like i guess americana maybe was the is the word for i mean the gummo yeah. stuff like that stuff fascinates me i i love that movie Gum have you, you've probably seen gummo oh, a hundred times Gum yeah i love it i try yeah. to explain it to people and and i'm just like it's little vignettes of of americana like it's just different mm -hmm. and it's beautiful at the same time yeah. but it is it'll make you sick <laughs> yeah yeah it's which is yeah, exactly so i mean we didn't go into the map change video thinking like we want this to have the same effect as gummo um but it ended up being that way you know because it, it is the same thing it's just this it's a small sort of middle american town that um you know just that it's kind of insulated it's kind of isolated there's just people uh, are developing identities just based on the other people's identities you know um not a lot of not a lot of world traveling uh, Buffalonians. You know, we don't get a lot of people from other countries here a lot. We don't get a lot of you know nobody. People only pass through Buffalo. It's not very much of a destination. So um, you know, it is. It it all, Buffalo almost has its own culture. And you watch Gummo, and it, it definitely looks like that's a, its own culture. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that the video was really really effective at, at showing people that 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 ugly beauty oh absolutely i absolutely agree and i i love how you frame buffalo that way because same with uh you know aside from tourism in alaska same thing like you don't see a lot of outsiders in wasilla right they all go to anchorage or seward and so yeah. 
getting a getting a worldview that's not what your parents thought is is you're literally relying before the internet of course when i was there was on magazines and and music and and when you said bad religion we opened for bad religion my first punk band opened for bad religion in alaska when i was in high school and really? trying, to, awesome. <laughs> trying to have a conversation with greg graffin and watching him like try to dumb it down like and not like with a high school kid that's just like enthralled yeah. with bad religion right like yeah. he always says like my students don't know my music and my music fans don't know my my studies mm -hmm. so like it was just a weird thing. and i did I had no yeah. idea who i was in the room with with brian baker right. and greg hetson like i didn't know their yeah. bands before bad religion i just knew they were in bad religion and right. uh right. but yeah so anyways but the the way you frame buffalo like that like how did you expand your worldview because you're 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 very switched on i know you've toured the world but before that when did those seeds start with you that hey this is not who i am um pretty early on i mean i was uh in in high school ninth or tenth grade i was you know straight edge vegan going to hardcore shows but i mean oh that all really just started because it was just kind of the, the kids that i fell in with um um uh, you know, it was, I mean, specifically, specifically for the, a lot of the music was when a, a, someone who had become a very good friend of mine and still is today um, in like junior high, which is like seven, eight years, moved to moved around the corner from me. Um, and he had an older brother and his older brother, you know, who had a driver's license was able to go downtown to the one record store that sold demo tapes and, you know, the counterculture of music, the mm -hmm. stuff that you wouldn't find in, in a record theater, or anything. So, you know, he, I would be at his house and his brother would come home with a bunch of music and we'd listen to it. And that was sort of my introduction. And I just, I became addicted to it. And once I found out that Buffalo like actually had a hardcore scene, like that you could go and watch the bands play that you had just heard on like a cassette tape. I mean, that in my, you know, little nascent brain, I was thinking like, oh my God, this is like, I'm going to be in the room with a bunch of professional musicians there who are like in my, to me, celebrities, because they're, they've made music that's on a tape that's being sold at a store. Like that's, that's fame. They must be famous. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. um, I was like, you know, exhilarated to, to go to a show and, and see this thing. And I realized that it was not what I had seen on like MTV. You know, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a concert. It was a show. It was BFW Hall. And, uh, you know, I, it wasn't what I expected, but I, I loved it so much more because it was just so intimate. So once I realized that, like, these bands are on tour. Oh, they travel everywhere. They take this thing everywhere they go. And it happens day after day after day, not just on the weekends when it happened to be in Buffalo. I mean, it was a really kind of surreal concept to grasp. But once I did, I was like, that's that it has to be that way. So then I, I my first like excuse to get out was uh, right when I graduated high school. I went to Virginia Tech for like a semester, um, you know, just travel. I just wanted to get out. <laughs> I didn't do much homework as far as like where I should go. I just <laughs> knew I wanted out. Yeah. Um, so I w went to Virginia Tech and, you know, when uh, I was there, I found the hardcore scene there that was like at this kind of punk house and uh, turmoil played, you know, 400 oh, years. Yes. Through. So I was like, oh, my God, I've seen these guys in Buffalo. I'm seeing them in Virginia. This is their life. This is the life that I want. So uh, yeah, I just went after it. Man, it was was Jordan with you this whole time too, like like with with uh, so, getting into shows. How much younger is he? Yeah, he's uh, uh, he's eighty one, so he's two years younger than me. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, he and I, uh, you know, our, our parents were driving us to the same shows when we were younger, um, and then went to Virginia, came back from Virginia Tech, um, and uh, you know, I told him, I was like, hey, let's we should just start a band because I knew he'd been playing guitar, and, you know, always was. So, so we should just start a band. So we kind of we scouted uh, Andy and and our first drummer, Rat Boy. They they were a package deal. If you if you wanted one, you had to take the other. So. <laughs> We did. And, uh, yeah, it, that, that, that was just it. I mean, it was just so, um, it was never an op I mean, I, I hate to use this as, but like failure was not an option. We didn't even, it, and not only, it, it not only wasn't an option, like 
it didn't exist to us. Like, it's not like, Hey, we can't fail. It was like, there's no such thing as failure. Everything we do is going to be fun and we're going to do it as long as we possibly can. And, you know, I don't think any of us expected it to last 20 years, but it has. And we've just kind of been working on that, uh, that tenet of like, it's a, nothing is failing if you're enjoying it, you know, and other people are enjoying it. Oh, absolutely. That's a really good way of putting it because Mm -hmm. yeah, you could be playing shows out on the weekends only in Buffalo. Flow, and if that's what makes you happy, you sure, succeeded. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Oh, yep. People just need to get that their heads around that concept I and know, be it's happier so easy. with where they are at. I know it's so easy to just like everyone is is trying to just make things so complex and get these uh, unrelated aspects of their lives to correlate into you know fit fit a very good story that but like it's it's so much simpler than that it is so fucking simple you just gotta do what makes you happy i mean everything else comes into place after that yeah dude uh, it, what Ian Mackay says i i wake up excited because of what i'm going to be doing you know that day mm-hmm. you know i'm doing what i want to do uh mm-hmm. not what yeah. i have to do and that keeps him going that's how he can do an interview of totally. asking about Fugazi six times a day, every day of yeah. the year, uh, yeah. and still have a smile on his face. Yeah, it's crazy too because, like, I mean, I, I'm not, um, I'm not completely guilt free of this, but like, you know, when you're on the road and you you play the same cities and you play the same venues, it does become a routine as as non routine and non traditional as as touring is. And there becomes a little bit of a routine, uh, you know, okay, I know exactly where we're going today. I, I know how to get there without looking at a map. I, we know the promoter, we know uh, the, all the, you know, the ins and outs of the venue. This is kind of becoming sort of a job. You, you know, you get that thought in your head once in a while. It's like, this is now starting to be a little bit of a job. Like I already know too much about what the day's going to hold, but then like, it really there are so many factors that change on tour so fucking quickly so it does kind of get like an exciting game like i wonder what fucking weird shit is gonna happen today. Cause <laughs> there's all the possibility in the world for weird shit to happen you know it yeah. could be a fucking van accident it could be you know a, a, a water main break in the venue while you're loading in i mean it, it could all these things that happen there's no preparing for it. no amount of touring is gonna prepare you for like I said, like an accident on the road or, you know, a shady promoter or a club that doesn't have power, you know, there's no, so that's the exciting part of it is just kind of waking up and be like, what fucking weird shit is going to happen? Yeah. All the Murphy's law shit where, yeah, yeah if it oh, can't go yeah. wrong, it will. And, <laughs> and you guys have been through a van accident, haven't you? Like yeah, a- we were, uh, we were in one in like 2005, I think, okay. uh, we were on tour with story of the year and, uh, from first to last and yeah, we fl- we flipped it in, uh, in some ice, but what a it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a wild one. We, I mean, some of the tour packages we've been on, like you look at them now and you're like, holy shit. Like if that were happening today, I mean, the, the prime example I use for this is, um, American nightmare. Uh, headlined, then My Chemical Romance, and then us. And that was a tour. Dude. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> hardcore kids and any kid, really, that even likes music would fucking, you know, kill to see that lineup today. Yeah. Dude, we played over My Chemical Romance one time. We played we played after them uh, yeah. on a show, and that was very early on. And then all of a sudden, we started getting shows with them all the time, and they were playing bigger. Like, it was, so that was like, and we were chasing tours, like the same town. Mm-hmm. They'd be playing. We'd be playing like Sin Thirteen in in uh, San Antonio, and they'd be playing like three blocks away at the next club. So we would go watch uh, each other's bands, and then all yeah. of a sudden, they're wearing bulletproof vests on the biggest stage yeah. in the world, and it's like, what the yeah. fuck happened? Yeah, I uh, I remember that on that tour that I was talking about, like we were in Dallas at Trees, I think it was called. Yeah, it's Trees. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're, it's just it's a hardcore show, and we're playing pretty much on the floor and. Um, so somebody from the My Chemical Romance crew or one of the band guys I actually forget had it, walked in with the spin magazine and like Gerard was like a full page spread yes. in spin and he's just like we're just like sitting at a table eating nacho chips you know like stale chips yeah. and drinking warm water out of a bottle it's like uh what, what's going on like what the fuck is going on here so I was kind of like uh, clocked like all right this is <laughs> this band is going to be fucking enormous and yeah, yeah well, we'll be all yeah, yeah, it happened. Jesus yeah. Christ, dude. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's funny. And a lot of a lot of kids don't realize that the people they're looking at in magazines still live with their parents at home and don't have any money. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. 
but they aspire yeah. to have what they have, which is something they went out and got and had fun with and, and struggled for. And I, I remember when touring became a job for me was I remembered uh, a Chevron bathroom when I went back in again a week later on the way back from a place we had already played. So like it, I, I started recognizing bathrooms in Chevron's. Yeah. Where I was like, this yeah. is too much. Like I have been doing this for too long at my, for myself. And I was like, yeah. this is really starting to get shitty. And then finally going to Europe and then be like, wow, everything's new. Every bathroom I go into is new. Every store I go into, I've never been to before. And then it became exciting again. And then we get back to the States and exactly like what you're saying, the things that go wrong and making it work became the fun. Yeah, 100%. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, dude, let me, I want to, there's a few things I really wanted to talk to you about too. Um, you know, I don't do a lot of research on these episodes because I like to just okay. keep it real, but I know yeah. with, with you, with, um, with your family, you had a sister, uh, with special needs. Um, yes. my son, uh, which I mentioned earlier has special needs yeah. much different than your sisters. And I'm sorry to hear that she passed. And I, I really, am. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but my my daughter is growing up with my son, and mm -hmm. she is having such a hard time. Uh, she's always standing up for him. She's always looking out for him. But the struggles mm -hmm. that she goes through, uh, being a typical child, mm -hmm. are really starting to show. And yeah. what was it like for you growing up in that situation? I'm just looking for some perspective because uh, – you know, it's, it's something that's really hard for especially mm -hmm. a child that did not ask to be put in this situation, right. either of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, that's gotta be very difficult. I mean, I can, I can only imagine, um, you know, I, I was kind of it, living it. Um, so I, I didn't have a, a full, uh, vantage point of seeing the entire situation when I was growing up, I just knew what I knew, but as mm -hmm. a parent now I can imagine it's, it's gotta be very difficult. Um, it, it, it just speaking, you know, as a kid that, that realized that my sister was different, but I didn't know how, because she was young and yeah. the thing about Rett, the thing about Rett's disease is that it, uh, it was so rare back then that we didn't know, well, they didn't even have a name for it until she was much older. Um, and it didn't start to even manifest, um, until she was getting to the age where she should have started doing things that other children were not, but, for most of her like infant life and as a toddler, you know, you couldn't really tell that anything was wrong, except that she was a little listless here and there and, you know, kind of lacked ability to focus. Um, but she just, you know, you just thought she was quiet or just, you know, mm -hmm. growing her own. Um, but then once I, you know, I remember my mom sitting me down and, and trying to explain to me what exactly was going on. And I just, and, you know, she's like, they just don't know, you know, we don't know what this is and we don't know how to help it. And, it, it might be difficult. Blah, blah, blah. And I, I just remember being like, but there is a chance that it'll get better. Right. And, you know, she's like, yeah, well, yeah, it's, I mean, uh, uh, as good a chance of that as any. And I was like, all right, well, that's what it's going to be then. And I just kind of went on just, you know, assuming that the doctors are going to find something to help them because it just didn't make sense to me that they wouldn't. But, um, you know, obviously they never did, but it, it became something when I realized that this was getting to be a little more difficult. It was a, it was a purpose for me. It was like the first time I ever had like a purpose as an older brother, like mm -hmm. protect her, look out for her, help her, you know? So instead of, um, it, it helps me take a lot of that confusion and, and focus it and sharpen it a little bit and some of that like helplessness kind of helped me get a little more control over the situation which was okay i don't know what what is going on uh with her medical condition but i i know that as an older brother i'm gonna take care of her you know and that was it that's yeah. all i need to do and in every way, shape and form, that's what I need to do, whether it was, you know, um, just, you know, standing up to people that were using, you know, terrible words to describe her or, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, take it. I, she had like because she eventually got matriculated into um, a, a, a quote unquote normal uh, elementary school, which is the same one I went to. They had a dance. So, like, I took her, to, you know, I, I went with her to the dance sort of thing, like. It wasn't, it was my attempt to just sort of, you know, normalize this uh, disease that a lot of people didn't have any familiarity with. So that, like I said, that, that sense of purpose was something that became very empowering, but it, it you know, I understand that, that your daughter, 
th- that has to click with her. You know, it's yeah. not really something yeah. you could tell tell a kid to do. Like, hey, go and you know stand up for 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 a child that's different. You know, because we should all be doing that. It's gonna click. You know, yeah. but um, when it does, that's when the dynamic will, will change drastically. So yeah. um, you know, it, she's gonna learn it. <laughs> Well, thank you for that, and and I and, and that's beautiful. Taking her to the dance like that, that kind of stuff. I mean, she's it's happened with my kids too, where my daughter, when she was four years old, uh, uh-huh. like got in a kid's face and yeah. said, "You oh, stay yeah. away from my brother." And I was, yep, and bad. the kid backed down, and I was like, "What the hell?" It, yeah, I never heard her talk like that. It was just like motherly, yeah, protective. Oh my god! Well, yeah, it's it's so pure, and yeah. it's just so, like it, it's yeah, it, pure is the best way to describe it. It's a it's a beautiful thing to see. I mean, I you know we we had friends too, like my friends growing up also would have become very protective of her too. So it was like it just felt good, you know, it just felt good. Like we get if she's got any problems, like there's this all these guys and we got this handled. You know, we were like yeah. Fuck it. Seven, seven or eight but it's like okay now we can do this like this this is it's the children don't need to children don't need to experience trauma to empathize with trauma that's a different main one of the main differences between them and adults is that uh, uh, adults can't really understand unless they can internalize but children don't really need to do that they just need to see that something's wrong and they handle it so uh yeah that's really awesome that that's you did a really that. good point keith uh, that's a really great point i've never even thought of it that way yeah, it's uh, unfortunate, but it's, it's like, true. and to put it in a trivial way, I guess it's like learning to, you, when you're a kid, you lift with your legs and you, you learn to yeah. not do it later. Right. And you fuck yeah. yourself up. But yeah. that's, uh, that's a really good way of putting it. I've, uh, that's some really good perspective. I appreciate that. That's, uh, you know, and you and I have gone through similar things with, and, and mainly, um, so you're, you're a parent now. Uh-huh. Going through that childbirth situation uh, mm-hmm. that you went through, uh, I completely understand. I mean, it's as much as I can. I, both my kids' uh, births were traumatic emergencies. And, oh, Jesus. And, dude, when I, when I heard you talking about, you know, uh, having to take the baby at 30 weeks, um, mm-hmm. getting having to get taken to another hospital – yeah. Um, while your wife is trying to recover, mm-hmm. that happened to me twice. And, Jesus, and what, what was it? So my son, uh, we didn't know he had, so we knew something was wrong. My wife knew something was wrong. She felt like something was wrong. The doctor mm-hmm. said everything's cool, uh, but there's this thing called a single vessel cord. So the, the, the arteries and veins are reversed in the umbilical sac. Uh, so like instead of fresh blood going through the arteries, it's the opposite. Um, oh no! And so there's Whoa. two. I think there's two veins or two arteries in a vein, and mm-hmm. in a normal pregnancy, this one there was one of each. So mm-hmm. when the child gets bigger, there's not enough waste being pulled out, and they can die. Yeah. So they man. said we're gonna have to take him early, um, mm-hmm. because of this. And there could this does lead to heart problems. This does lead to other things. So yeah. we're gonna get it checked out. The, yeah. the, uh, they sent us to this heart specialist here in port, like a heart center. They did an mm-hmm. ultrasound said, Nope, everything's fine. The heart looks great. So we went for natural birth, uh, inducing, um, his heart crashed. We're like, well, what's going on? They had an emergency C-section. So this whole, like be- this was, so I have a stepdaughter who's mm-hmm. almost older. This was my first like birth of my child. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm building it up in my head to be this monumental occasion. Oh, yeah. And yep. it turned into a living nightmare, which in turn changed my entire personality and my entire yep. view of the world. And yes. so all of a sudden, I'm resp- they get him out. He's alive. Mm-hmm. He looks good. Okay. We put him in the nursery. Hey, we don't feel pulses in his feet. We need to look at this. Mm-hmm. His, his aorta was kinked. It's called a coarctation. They had to do heart surgery at four days old. And Jesus Christ. Immediately you're sitting there, and I know you've been through the situation where you're sitting there and there's a box of Kleenex on the table, and they have that hard talk with you. Uh, yeah. And now you're responsible for a human life, and you say what happens. And it's the most fucked up thing to be put into uh, yeah. that I can even describe. And oh, yeah. I mean, you've been through this. So with, with my daughter, so my son, everything worked out. I mean, he's got his issues, but he, he survived in the NICU. Got him home. My daughter came early. Uh, my wife was bleeding and uh, like way early, weeks early. Um, yeah. 
And basically, they set her down in a hospital bed. Everything's fine. They're like, I think we can control the bleeding. I think we're good. We'll keep her in there. Her lungs aren't ready. <laughs> I go home to be with my son, uh, who's at home with, with uh, his sister, <clears throat> uh, my stepdaughter. And I get a call. You need to come back right now. Uh, uh, what do you mean? I, I can't leave Grayson with, you know, uh, uh -huh. Callie. I, so anyways... I had to leave him with, with Callie while our mm -hmm. sister-in-law uh, came to the house, just knowing she was going to be there. I walk yeah. into our OB in uh, workout gear, sweating, mm -hmm. fresh from the treadmill. They called her at the gym and said, get here now. She stopped me and said, all right, I don't know how to say this. Uh, we don't think we can save both of them. Oh Who my am God. I saving? Oh, my God. And I said, what? Like, all that PTSD came back. And yeah. Uh, and we also had stuff during the pregnancy. We had to have uh, to see if she was going to have the same issues as Grayson. Um, mm -hmm. They had to go in, you know, uh, in vitro or in vitro and in utero and mm -hmm. take a sample. And that could have caused a miscarriage instantaneously. We had to decide on that anyway. Uh, so she, so I, you know, I said, I said the baby, because that's what my wife would have said. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I walked in and I couldn't really tell her what had just been told to me because she's yeah. terrified. Anyways, taken out, nick you again, uh, collapsed lung, horrible situation. So long story short, that changed me inside. That changed <laughs> my mind. It changed my heart. It changed my view of the world. It changed my view of, uh, you know, even looking forward to something seemed dirty at that point because yeah. I didn't want to yeah. be tainted. How did you work through that? And what I noticed you said something about like your sense of humor was gone. Because oh, yeah. that record you put out after that was dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I appreciated it so much because it was real at the time for me, especially. Yeah. How did you come back from that if you did? And kind of walk me through that if you don't mind. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, th that, those are uh, t terrible stories. I'm, I'm sorry. To do I'm sorry that. to go on so long uh, on, the, on my oh, stuff. No, no, no. It, this no, is your, this is your show. No, 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 no. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, it was just one of those things where I, I, I look back on it and I don't remember a lot of it. Um, I, I, I really feel like now looking back and trying to explain it, I was just kind of operating from a different place in my brain where I didn't, it was just maximum efficiency. Like, okay, let's not let emotion get in the way. Let's, we just, we just need to figure out every problem that comes up. And we got to handle it one problem at a time. We can't big picture this. We really need to take this like slowly and make sure that each step is very, very measured, very careful. Um, so I don't really remember a lot of those moments where it's like, okay, what's this decision? What's this decision? What's this decision? Mm -hmm. I was just, I was operating at, like I said, like maximum efficiency of like, uh, it was just a machine. My brain it just became a machine that was only handling data and absolutely no emotion and <laughs> nothing astral, no, you know, nothing physical. It was strictly like the, the numbers and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the reading of the graphs and things like that. And then the, the reading of the monitors. And it just became this thing where I was so set on just getting through that, the experience that I didn't really care how it, uh, how it would affect the rest of my life or anything else. I just want to get through that experience. So I did that, you know, a lot. And, and I don't think it really, the shock didn't really settle um, until a few weeks into it um, when everything was starting to actually get better. Then I think the the gravity of the situation really set in. It became like really, really dark. Like I, I, I felt guilty that I was so um, uh, focused on, you know, the, 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 I hate to say the unemotional aspect of it, but it was it was very um, pr like primal almost. And, and I hated that because I felt like maybe I wasn't weighing it enough and maybe I should have made different decisions. And, you know, there, there, why wasn't I considering my child more in this decision? Why wasn't I considering my wife more in this decision? Those sort of things. But I didn't really have time to, to reckon with myself. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of the guilt set in, of course, like, uh, what could I have done differently from the beginning? Like, what, what did, should I have seen signs and this whole period of questioning and, and things like that. And so that was kind of where I was at when I had started writing the lyrics was obviously it's very humorless like I may have just uh, indirectly killed my family you know because yeah. of this, uh, yeah. this whole situation um, but very quickly after that uh, it became 
um, a sort of thing where I realized that maybe the, the and I don't mean to sound like new age hippie dippy, <laughs> like maybe the universe just provides maybe in situations like that where so many things are so uncertain that accepting that uncertainty and becoming comfortable with that uncertainty is the best thing that you can do because things will work at their pace and in the way that they're supposed to be working. Um, and you know, the long and the short of it was, it just gave me a lot of trust in things that I don't understand. Uh, you know, I mean, doc, first, first of all, doctors, like doctors are telling me things. I, I'm obviously not fucking registering any of this shit. I have no idea what any of this means, you know, mm -hmm. but I trust the doctors. So I don't need to take medical classes in order to make a decision. It's just, I trust these doctors. I'm going to do what they think I should do. And that's the way it's going to be. Um, but then, but sort of expanding on that, it was okay. Well, can I apply that to my life? You know, can I apply that same sort of thing of like, there's a lot of shit that I don't understand. There's a lot of shit that I don't know, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't trust it. So it became a real, um, uh, like a boot camp for, for listening to instinct and things like that, of just believing that things are going to work out the way they're supposed to. And, you know, what seems like, you know, the darkest part of your life eventually becomes the, the most groundbreaking turning point. Like you said, it changed the way that you you know, you, you thought about things and change the person you became and probably for the better. I can't, you know what I mean? Like after all that terrible stuff, I can't imagine you came, you came out of that a worse person. Like there's just no way that that's going to happen. So I, I, I feel like it just, it, it handles, the, the, you know, life handles itself in the way that it's always meant to be handling itself and trying to get too much control over it. Um, is actually what's going to inhibit it from doing what it's supposed to do. So I'm now very glad that I didn't sort of give into those emotions, those very human emotions, because that sort of halts the progression of this process of uh, recovery, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I just I feel like if and, and that at that point I was done writing the lyrics, I felt like I was kind of out of the the the. the the cloud coverage of all of it. And I, uh, then I started watch and, you know, watch is a little more hopeful, but it's still, there's a, a guy who's dealing with loss and things like that. So I just mm -hmm. sort of figured out a way to tell it in a story because that's kind of just always been the way that I deal with shit. So yeah, then I just started watching. I have my, you know, newborn child at home now, finally my wife's at home, everyone's fine. It all worked out in the end, which I'm thankful for. So yeah. I don't think about questioning anything prior to that. Um, yeah, and then I've just focused on writing a book and I kind of, you know, I guess I kind of got out of it a little easier because I didn't do too much reflection other than the writing, the lyric writing for the album, mm -hmm. which, you know, is now is now on record and, you know, yeah. will you know, will be there for, uh, you know, all, all the time. But, uh, uh, yeah, I don't really think I don't really think too much about it. Looking back, I just sort of I, I know that I've uh, I've taken the lessons from it and um, I'm applying them at every turn, you know, in, in day to day now. Yeah, it, I, 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 and I appreciate that a lot in, in, in that story because hearing other fathers go through this mm -hmm. kind of thing, you think you're the only one. I mean, you're oh, in a yeah. NICU. You see people with problems way worse than your own. But I, I kind of acquit it going or like going to space is something very few people get to do, right? Going when you break yourself down to your very DNA and go complete, like, what is it, DOS mode where it's all code? Yes. To yes. go to that point in your life is something I don't think a lot of people actually get to do. And no. to be such a, and I, that's where I say like my DNA changed because it literally went back in and changed the coding yeah. in my brain. Totally agree. Uh, totally agree. And, and the fact that you were able to give yourself up to that and mm -hmm. be, be present in that, like I can't describe, and I know you've been there, but to people listening, what it's like when your wife uh, just went through a traumatic situation, you now have a child that depends only on you. And one's at one hospital and one's at the other. And where do I go? Where do I stay? Where do I go back to? Like, do I stay yep. here the whole time? Do I run here? Do I trust the doctors and leave the child there? Do I, you know, that's a situation that very, like, I know a lot of people have been in it, but maybe not a lot of people listening, but it's something that is so profound. I can't, and I share that yeah. with you because it's something you and I have both been through. And I feel a, a, a special kinship with people that have been through that totally. because it's something, you know, uh, 
at some point we could probably talk about a lot more later, but uh, I appreciate you sharing that with me. And I really wanted to get your take on it because I don't get to talk to a lot of uh, yeah, fathers yeah. that have been through that. So, right. um, yeah, I appreciate very it helpful, too. I, you know, um, absolutely. Definitely. And, uh, well, so where, where does this take you now? Where is your writing gone now after going through that experience? I mean, uh, are you, are, are you working on another book? Do you have more music you're working on? Like where does your um, writing sit now? Um, after so going we, through that, we just fin- we actually have a new record recorded. Uh, we we wrote and recorded it, um, and then two weeks later, the pandemic hit. Um, oh. So yeah, we're just sitting on it, um, but we're not going to do anything with it until we can tour again because it deserves. You know, I mean, everyone's uh, everyone's music deserves to be toured on if they put everything into it that they you know hold sacred which is you know what you try to do when you're in a recording studio so sure. we uh we we don't want to just like throw it into the into the furnace of, uh, of online content that gets absorbed and, and quickly uh shit out uh while people are binge watching shows and you know trying to find ways to distract themselves from the truth that the you know the world is <laughs> uh, but, you know yeah. <laughs> pretty much dilapidating around us but uh yeah, so we, we're hoping that the, the bands start touring again soon. Um, but I will say that, like, the writing for this album, uh, and I was very, very, very fucking excited about touring on this album because it's just such a different album as far as, like, the attitude of it. It's, uh, it's very it, – it, I was very excited to realize that I, I kind of got back to the playfulness of old Eted. You know, okay. um, yeah. uh, so I, I do feel like this is this is on par uh, – I mean, I, honest, I honestly, honestly – feel like this is the best record and after we did low teens i was like okay there's no chance i'm ever going to write like this again and and i feel like low teens was the first time anyone um really took me seriously as a writer because there was no uh you know no like cheap humor in it you know none of those like devices that i used because they were fun it was just very serious and i was I, i found a way to to appropriately translate what I was thinking and going through. Um, and a lot of people recognize that. And it was, it, as far as what I saw about like reviews and things, it was, you know, oh, this is his, these are his best lyrics. Blah, blah, blah. So I, I knew that I was never going to top that. And I was like, if I can't, if I know I'm not going to do that, then why, why would I even do another record? Like, I, I just, I can't imagine having a, an experience that's going to inspire lyrics that could be more of what that is, you know, and I don't, I don't think I want to. So I don't know if there's a point to do it. So uh, I kind of argued, uh, you know, with myself about that as a con- well, internal conflict, but I was like, okay, fuck it. Like this, I'm in a band, bands make records. Well, let's fucking write a record. So I did. And, you know, sat down to start writing and found out that I was, having fun with it again the music was fun to me again so um but i think that you know anybody that got into eat it because of like the light-hearted jovial uh you know f- lyrical content or anything that di- that missed that from low teens get that back in in spades now I, I think it's it's you know just so much better than any of our other records and it's it feels like a new band again after going it which is wild because the last record was about a, a birth and this is the, you know, it was very much a, a rebirth of us too. And this yeah. is our first, this is our first, uh, uh, offering after that rebirth. So, um, the, yeah, it feels like a brand new band to me. I'm really excited to get back out there Dude. if we can. Yeah. That sounds amazing. And, and this is the first record goose played on then, huh? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Okay. And Cause you guys had did. another he drummer on low teens. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Davidson. Yeah. Who, okay. yeah. From um, Norma but, Jean as well. <laughs> yeah, also from Norma Jean. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Goose is, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, we knew Goose was, we knew Goose was something really special, and we we were about to start a headlining tour, and we still hadn't found a drummer yet. So, like, yeah. so our first headlining tour on Low Teens, we were going out with Knock Loose, and we we're like, this is going to be a big tour. You know, maybe we need to like really, really hunker down and make and try out drummers and make sure that we can do this because this is going to be the beginning of a long process and we couldn't find any, we couldn't find anybody like none of the people that we knew personally uh were able to do it uh but goose who we had never really met before just kind of knew of him offered and he's like i'll come to buffalo i'll practice and and we really i'm not like i think maybe three days before tour started <laughs> um, so we're like yeah all right get here 
Uh, so he did, and he just sat in a garage uh, uh-huh. with headphones on in a, a, a like garage door closed, so to not disturb any neighbors. Just sweating and and beating the drums for three days straight. Mm-hmm. Went on tour. He it was like he it was like he wrote the stuff, and then we get into the studio to record the new stuff. And the the things that he's doing on it are so extraordinary. I mean, I, I was blown away because I, all I knew was that he was really good at doing what he heard done before. Uh-huh. But I didn't, you know, I didn't know to what extent you'd be able to create new things, you know, and that's just the, not that I ever doubted him, but, it, but I just didn't know. Yeah. There was no proof. Yet. Yeah. You didn't so have time we get in there and yeah. And holy shit. He, uh, yeah, he is an imaginative and incredible drum player. So uh, I'm I'm so excited, so Dude, excited. I'm excited yeah. to hear it, man. And if this, this will come out in like mid October. Uh, mm-hmm. Can we, can we put that stuff in there or, or uh, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure I don't like, we're not like the headline grabbing podcast. That's not what it's, as you can tell us, not what it's about, but uh, when it's in there, I like to make sure before I can cut it out. Absolutely. If need be. No, um, yeah, it's good. Okay. But yeah. um, dude, Keith, I've, I've had you on an hour, dude. Thank you so much for the time of and course, the perspective man. and uh, you know, years of great music. And now I'm getting into the books which is also awesome. another thing. And, and then having, you know, uh, something we share on a, on a higher yeah, level, you know, definitely. reach out if you ever need to talk about that stuff or hit I a wall, that, you man. know what I mean? And, and, uh, dude, I'm just stoked for, for the future. I'm glad you're back in action and, and as much as you can be with this whole yeah. bullshit, but, yeah. uh, I just look forward to everything in the future, man. I, I, and I really appreciate the time. Cool, man. Me too. I uh, I re- really appreciate you, uh, you know, talking openly about this shit. It's not easy, so I, I definitely appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, buddy. Well, I'll let you get back to your uh, your uh, wife and kid and, and uh, awesome. yeah, back to Paw the real Patrol. world. Paw, yeah, Paw Patrol, Paw, baby. Paw, Paw Patrol or Peppa's uh, on right now, so I'm going to get out there. <laughs> right on. Okay, buddy. We'll take care and we'll, we'll be in touch. Awesome. Take All care, right, man. Bye. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Keith Buckley from Every Time I Die. Once again, huge shout out to Andrew Hurley for hooking us together. Thank you so much, buddy. And thank you for coming back week after week to all of you. I really, really appreciate it. And I mean, the show, like I say, is nothing without you guys. And and it's just me talking and recording it and putting it out to nothing. So thank you so much for all the comments and, and questions and and uh, yeah, I might put up like a frequently asked questions portion on the website because I get asked a lot of the same thing, especially about the intro song to the podcast, which is uh, Hobosexual, uh, their song Trans Am Sunday off of the album Monolith. And Ben Harwood was also on the show a few years back. You can go check out his episode uh, if you're interested to find out more about that band. But they are incredible. And that song blew my mind the second I heard it. I knew it had to be the theme song, and uh, so thanks to them for giving me license to use that. All right, so uh, not a ton left to say, guys. Keith was awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Hopefully, um, our chat about you know the personal stuff with the birth story and and things like that didn't uh, trigger anybody, but um, you know it's important stuff to talk about and get it out there. And when you can connect with somebody that way, uh, it means a lot, especially you know to me personally being able to connect to somebody that's been through a similar situation because it is a it it literally changes your life it changes your your soul it changes your dna and it's something i can't even explain it in words you have to feel it for yourself and and hopefully none of you have to go through that um but it it changes you and i'm a different person now than i was before and i always will be um i don't think you go back to where you were before that it's one of those life-changing events that um you know for better for worse you're different so Um, Thank you for bearing with that. Hopefully somebody got something out of it uh, besides myself. But anyway, I'm going to get out of here. I've got lots of going on, lots more interviews to do. And uh, yeah, got to bring you guys those amazing, amazing chats, right? (laughs) Uh, Anyways, so man, I'm going to get out of here before I keep rambling on for another 10 minutes. Uh, But as always, guys, we'll see you on the radio.